All right, so hi everyone. Are you able to hear me clearly and see my screen clearly? On my screen, you must be seeing course on big data with Hadoop and Spark. And now I'm changing the slides to the introduction to Linux. Okay. Are you able to see the screen clearly and he hear my voice clearly? David, are you able to hear me clearly? Okay. So, all right, all right. Okay, so looks like the audio is clear for Hitendra. Noor and Bintao, my voice is clear because Bintao is from Canada. I'm hoping that the audio is clear. David, where are you from? Pittsburgh, okay, okay. All right, so if you have a headphone or uh, some other device, it'll be better to use that. Okay, I would suggest that in case your, uh, if the audio is not clear on the laptop, have another device logged in using the phone. And sometimes the audio on the phone is better than the laptop, laptop or Mac, okay. Uh, no, just join, uh, join, open in the phone the same URL, and it will it will connect. So to me, it looks like the internet may not be an issue, but the the issue could be in the device. The issue could be in the device. So try the try the phone or some other mechanism. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so yeah. I'm not speaking too much. I'm uh, speaking once in a while. And uh, open uh, in the phone, open the same URL in, the, in, the, in your smartphone, open the same URL and it should open in the, in the, in the, in the Zoom. All right. Alvin Bintao. Ravi, Hitendra, Sachin, Subhu, Gaurav, and Noor. Is my voice clear? No, actually the same Zoom software will launch on your phone. There is a Zoom app in both uh, Android and uh, Apple. So you should be able to open Zoom. All right. 
Okay, so don't worry then about the notes. Generally, the Google Docs displayed that way. Okay. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Yes, it's a big data class. It's about to start. In the meantime, we are trying to see if the audio is clear with all of you. So I was speaking something. So, yep. So we're going to talk about the, we, today we're going to just give you an overview, then talk about Linux and then talk about Zookeeper. And it's going to be a hands-on class. So be on the laptop as well. Okay, so be on the laptop as well as maybe if you have the audio, if you want from the phone, you can do that. So generally, a couple of students, what they do is they open the, uh, the, the Zoom meeting URL in the smartphone as well as in, the, in their laptop or desktop. And uh, they basically log in from both the devices. It's up to you, your comfort label. And uh, logging in just from the laptop is also good enough or desktop is also good enough. So just that be ready that you might have to type, okay? Be ready that you might have to do the hands-on with the class, okay? So we are completely okay if you log in from multiple devices, like for example, Subu has logged in from phone and the normal desktop, okay? So feel free, it's up to you, your comfort level. We don't have a problem if you log in from multiple devices. <clears throat> okay, this uh, Zoom can support up to 50 members. So there is no issue of uh, multiple, multiple logins. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, David, is, is it clear on the iPhone? Great, great. So should we start? All right, so let's, yeah, thank you, Bindal. Great, great, wonderful. So, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to just share uh, the link to the presentation. These, uh, um, these slides are kind of confidential, so uh, do not share with everybody. So I'm going to just give you the link for now, and then these will be available in the in the course as well. Okay, I'm going to walk you through the course. So this is Linux console slides, and these are these are okay. These are. Okay, so if somebody has asked in the session, just copy paste these two URLs and give it to them. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we are going to talk about three things in the session. Number one is, uh, where is the course? Okay, that's a common question that where is my course? So when you log in here, I'll just walk you through this so that uh, everybody is on the same page. Then uh, as you come to the website, you click on login and in the login, you can uh, click on sign in with Google. I prefer signing in with Google. So, okay, so I'm going to use my Sandeep Giri at Gmail. All right, great. So, all right. Hi everyone, today we are going to get started with the course, okay? Hi Alvin, Aniket, Bintao, David, Gaurav, Godwin, Ravi and Grisma, Hitendra, Noor, Rajan, Ravi, Robin, Sachin, Subhu. All right, so um, do you think that it'll be a good idea to uh, get an introduction of all of you? It should be... Uh, because we are going to work together for maybe around uh, around um, 20 sessions. Those who have signed up for the entire course, most of you have signed up for the entire course, will stay uh, for for around 20 sessions. So it'll be better that we we get to know each other. 
all right so should we just uh, quickly do um, uh, one round of introduction so about yourself um, where are you located and what what are you doing so that will be uh, good and since the session is being recorded so it will be available in the recordings as well all right so all right so alvin is it okay to unmute you Hey, this is Alvin, and I'm, I'm a Java developer. I live in Chicago. Uh, all right, Alvin. All right, so Alvin is from Chicago and is a Java developer. Okay, yep. So yes, uh, one more thing before we start the session. Some of you might require the video immediately. Okay, so I will allow you to record the video. So those of you who want to be allowed to record the video, just let me know. I'll just let me know in the beginning. I'll just allow you to record the video. So, so this, this, the recorded video of this session will be available to you after, after around 12 hours uh, of the session, but you can get it faster if you are recording by yourself. So feel free to record and let me know. I'll give you the permission to record. Okay. So sometimes what happens is some of you are stepping out and are not able to focus on the class. In those cases, you generally want to record it so that you can uh, later on watch it immediately after session. Okay, so just let me know in case you want to record, I'll give you the permission. Okay, so for Subu, I'm just en enabling it. Okay. All right. Great, great. So. The uh, question from Sachin is, can we download the recorded video? So we make it available on YouTube and there are some YouTube downloaders. You can use those tools to uh, download the YouTube video. For example, there is something called KeepFed. Using that, you can do that. We don't have a problem in sharing the video with you. It's okay to download the video. It's just that YouTube doesn't allow directly the download. So you might have to use the roundabout way. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So. All right, good to know you, Alvin. So uh, Aniket, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, this is Aniket. I'm based out of Sacramento, California, and I'm an integration specialist and recently started working on Hadoop. Wonderful, wonderful to know you, Aniket. Um, Bintao, you could go ahead. You can unmute yourself and then go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, this is Bin Tao Li from Toronto, Canada. I'm looking for a job, uh, position as a data scientist now. That's all. All right, wonderful. Wonderful to know you, Bin Tao. David, you could go ahead. No, not yet, not yet. We are not able to hear you. Wonderful, wonderful to know you, David. Gaurav, you could go ahead. Yeah, hi, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, hi, I'm Gaurav, uh, based out of uh, Bangalore, India. Uh, I'm an Oracle DBA and uh, learning this uh, big data as I'm completely new to this technology. Wonderful. Wonderful to know you, Gaurav. Godwin Ravi.
good one, you could go ahead. So you'll have to unmute you yourself. There'll be an unmute button. And then go ahead. All right. Should we move on? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I yes, can hear you. Oh, oh, I was on mute. Oh, actually, there's an echo because uh, I think you have a, another machine. Okay, go ahead. It got muted at both the places. Yeah, I'm. My name is Ravi. I live in I uh, Dallas, Texas area. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I joined this session because I want to understand what uh, big data is all about. And Wonderful. I have IT background, uh, but this is something new to me. Great. Great to have you in the session, Grishma. You could go ahead next. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear uh, you. Uh, hi, Sandeep Grishma here. I'm ba I am based out of New Jersey. I'm working as database engineer. I just want to pick up a new skill. Wonderful. Uh, ahead of, of course, yeah. Great. Wonderful to know you, Grishma. Thank you. All right. Kartikeyan. Hi, Sandeep. Kartikeyan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is my first class. I actually I skipped the last class. I had. So I just want to get into big data. So mm -hmm. uh, I just call about <laughs> Cloudex Lab. Okay. It will be great going. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful to know you, Karthik. All right, and Hitendra, you could go ahead next. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm Hitendra Parik. I live in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. and I work on databases, uh, data warehouse on ETL side. Great, great, great to know you, Hitendra. Great to know you. All right. And Noor, you could go ahead next. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? R right. We, could we can hear you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Noor. I've recently moved to Australia. I'm currently looking for a career shift to data analytics and machine learning and big data. Uh, in the past, I worked for a multinational bank, mainly developing the core banking system and maintaining it. I've worked on database system, RDMS, transactional model, and have a little bit familiarity, uh, little bit uh, concept about no SQL, but no idea about big data. So hoping to have a grip on big data technologies from this course. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful to know you, Noor. Great, great. And Rajan, you could go ahead next. Hi, my name is Rajan. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm new to Hadoop and Spark, um, but I, I have experience in developing SaaS applications and uh, mostly with Java uh, mm -hmm. application architecture and integration. Uh, just uh, looking forward to learn more about uh, big data in general. That's it. Great, great, great to know you, Rajan. All right, and okay, uh, Ravi, you could go ahead next. Hi, Sandeep. Hi, everyone. I am Ravi. Uh, I'm located in Malaysia. I'm working in data warehousing technologies. Okay, okay, great, great, great to know you. And uh, Robin, you could go ahead next. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm based in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. I, I support IT and cybersecurity, and I wish to learn uh, big data, and I find your courses uh, compelling, like uh, machine learning and, and others. So thank you. Great. Great. Great to know you, Robin. Wonderful. And Sachin, you could go ahead next. Yeah, I'm Sachin. I, I belong to Bangalore, so I worked in already in big data technologies, but I have a, I'm a new beginner, so mm -hmm. I want to learn this course in detail. 
Wonderful. Wonderful to have you in the session, Sachin. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. So we could also benefit from your earlier learnings. Okay. Great. Great. And uh, all right. Great. And Sh Shavanti, you could go ahead next. Hello. Uh, yes, we can hear. Yeah. Uh, I'm Shavanti. Uh, I, I came a little bit late. Is this an introduction for us? Yes, I uh, know it's not an introduction. Uh, basically, we are trying to introduce each other because we are going to be in the session for around uh, around uh, 20 sessions. Okay, so it's better to know each other. That's why we are doing a brief introduction. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm Shavanti and I have two years of experience in IT. So mm -hmm. I'm just, I just want to learn Hadoop now. I mean, big data technology. Wonderful, wonderful to know you. And okay, Subhu, you could go ahead next. Hello. Hi, Sabu. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes. Hi, Sandeep. I am audible. Huh? Yes. Hi, Sandeep. Um, hi, everyone. This is Subhu. I'm from Malaysia. And uh, I'm a uh, <coughs> data warehousing background. And uh... OK, so looks like his connection dropped in midway. I couldn't hear. Hello? Yeah, your your voice dropped in mid between. Could you reintroduce from the beginning? I think I have logged in two devices. Uh, that I would see. be the problem. No worries, no worries. You go ahead. Yeah, uh, just I said uh, uh, I'm from data processing background, and I'm here for learning uh, data data engineering and data analytics. I would love to understand all about uh, Hadoop. Thanks. Great, great. All right, so great to know you, Subhu. And mm -hmm. all right, so wonderful, wonderful. So the way we are going to work in these sessions is number one, the sessions uh, will have part theory, part uh, hands-on, and uh, both of things will happen um, in the in the uh, during the session itself. There won't be. Um, separate lab class. So lab is available to all of us 24 by 7. Though uh, the class we have, uh, you know, removed that model where there will be separate time for uh, lab. So we would do things as we talk. Okay, we would do things as we talk. And I expect all of you also to do things as we talk. The first session was very, very theoretical. And in sessions going ahead, what we are going to do is we are going to do first and then talk later, okay? So that's what we are going to do, all right? Now, now, so, yeah, uh, somebody uh, is in. Yeah, go ahead, Ravi. Uh, hi, uh, Sandeep. Actually, this is my first class. Uh, okay. Could you please give me a brief uh, about what, what happened in the last uh, class? Like, uh... Sure, sure, no worry, no worry. I'll just give a brief, uh, so let me, all right? Great, 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 to, great, great. So yes, so let me, okay. So, uh, all right, so first of all, where is my content? Let me just try to show you that and then we'll start with the, with a brief recap and then continue with the Linux and then Jukeeper. All right, so, so great, great to have all of you in the session. And also one, one important thing that I would like to tell about the classes, number one, the in the class you could just type and ask the question but if the question is big and you think that it will take a while to type you could just ask if you can unmute or you can just unmute okay because if everybody unmutes suddenly then it will be a 
collision and we won't be able to hear so you feel free to ask questions as much as possible do not worry about that you are disturbing the class or something like that right these classes are meant for asking questions okay because the content is all over the world and you have this everywhere but these classes are the objective classes is a uh, sequence and the completeness of the technology stack that is one, one thing second these classes are meant to clear your doubts okay so feel free to ask the your questions are not going to stop the class instead they are going to help the class because others might have the same questions okay others might have the same questions and therefore make sure that you you ask keep asking questions all right you will only learn the parts where you ask the questions or you do the hands on with the class okay only those two things you will retain rest of the things trust me you will forget okay so only the things that you ask questions about as well as the things that you do hands on you will retain that for longer duration okay so so please uh, work with the work with me in this class okay and uh, learning learning any new things takes amount of uh, effort and you have taken the first step so it's going to be a great session the the truth is that truth is that even if uh, at some point you feel that because of too many questions the session is getting delayed we can take some extra class okay so do not worry about that all right so completing the course is not only the objective the i mean all of us need to need to learn what is what we came here for all right so these are the few words uh, that that we we live by all right so so first of all make sure that you log into cloudex lab once you log in go to my courses okay under my courses you will have two kinds of uh, course one is big data if you have signed up for both big data with hadoop and spark you will see this okay if you are have just signed up for big data with hadoop you will see only big big data with hadoop one so what you get as part of this course is one these are studio recorded courses these are this is studio recorded one i realized that a lot of people miss the classes and uh, therefore i and watching a recording is like watching the raw video of somebody's marriage and it's really really um, slow and boring if you watch the same video what we are having right now you may not be able to complete on time all right therefore we recorded in the studio and made it available to all the students so that in case you miss anything or you want to recap at any point of time you could just jump here and do that okay so this is this is a self paced course and this self paced course has all the exercises so all the exercises you must do here okay the objective of this course is going to be that you make all of these parts 100% except for few optional courses okay so so this is basically this has exercises hands on as well as the the theory classes everything will be is there in the self paced one okay the recordings of this class that is going on will be made available as part of a new playlist here okay as part of a new playlist i think this is the one yeah so this is where the this is where the recordings of the sessions will be available so session 1 recording is available here all right so this is how this is how you will locate so you will see one this playlist and other either this one or there would be something else all right so, uh, either this one or this one okay so those two three playlists uh, two playlists you will see all right so this way this way you could find after the session the second second uh, the next uh, the next uh, slide in the next uh, phase on this course is going to be the second session okay there will be a next button that we'll see and you could go there all right so there are two 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 course listings here one is the recordings and other is the complete self paced course okay so here you will see if you go into it you'll see the individual topic and then individual topic you can uh, start learning 
So for example, let's say you want to learn the Linux basics. So you could just click on start now. And here you will see in some of the exercises on the left hand side would be the theory and on the right hand side you will have the lab okay and it will keep on giving you the challenges okay like it it might give you a quiz or it might give you a challenge for example here okay it might give you this kind of a challenge and you might have to solve it on the right hand side okay so this way you will you will get to experiment with most of the technology and okay most of the technology and you'll see this now question from no is do we have the same content in the recorded version or do we expect different things so the recorded versions are are very crisp as in all the concepts are there no concept is repeated therefore sometimes a lot of people find that to be to be um, uh, very uh, not very deep okay so the other thing is uh, the questions that we answer in the class may not be available in the recorded recorded version okay because the questions are very important from the class and sometimes questions are very insightful and that is uh, helpful for the entire class so those kind of things may not be available in the self paced course okay so so this is a quick walk through this is a quick walk through and here you the other other than the my courses the other important tab is if you go to my lab my lab shows you these credentials these are the lab credentials the credentials for the lab and the cloudxlab.com are different A question from Bintao is there are less topics covered in my courses than yours. Okay. Yeah. The the thing is in my courses, there are all kinds of recordings and all possible things. So my course as in Sandeep Giri's course look overcrowded. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I'll also take a look at your account after the session if everything is in place. All right. Sandeep question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is Hitendra. Uh, you said Hi. lab credentials are different than uh, cloudx.com credentials. Yep, yep. So you see the lab credentials on the screen. This is the login password. So whether you're logging into Ambari, Hue, Web Console, or Jupyter, you'll be using these credentials. While if you are logging to MySQL, then this is the log login and this is the password okay so lab credential is specific to the various services and therefore you need to um, use this one all right okay okay good good all right great so all right so i prefer to uh, use the chat uh, unless uh, you have a bigger question okay wonderful wonderful uh, set of questions so so we have these and uh, before jumping into the rest of it you could you could do a couple of things here so under my lab you could try opening ambari okay i'm just opening ambari for me it opens uh, uh, with already logged in okay i'm logging into a different account admin account okay you just have to copy paste this login and this password into Ambari in order to log in. Okay, we'll talk about these services later. So are you able to log into Ambari? You can just put it in the chat if you are done. Are you able to log into the Ambari? Copy paste this login and this password into the login, okay? Okay, do it now because otherwise you will always uh, keep on delaying it. Uh, 
I see. No worries, David. I'll take a look at it. Okay. Let me just make a note of it. Okay. A password for the Ambari is the, the one that is displayed here, the lab credentials. You see here, this one? You can just press copy and then paste. Okay, why we have provided copy uh, is because we don't want to show it because if uh, let's say I'm showing you the demo, so I don't have to really show the password to the entire class and then log in. I can just copy paste. Okay, that's the reason why we have put the copy button next to the password as well. Okay, so this, if you go to my, my lab, you will be able to see lab credentials and under there, you'll be able to see the password. Okay. So Sachin is not able to log in. What does it say? Okay. Uh, does it? Question is, uh, does it copy the white spaces? Uh, not really, actually. It is not copying that. So this is that copy button. You see that? Okay. So in case the copy paste is not working, you can click on this I, which shows the password, and then you could just try typing that. Okay, if you're manually copying that, what will happen is you will copy the space as well. So Sachin and Alvin. Sachin, Alvin and Hitendra. Are you able to log in? Okay. Uh, Sandeep, do we have to log in as you? No, no, your own account. Everybody oh. has their own account. Okay. All right. So use your login and password because that's your workspace. And uh, everywhere in all these systems, you'll get a workspace and uh, so that you can keep your work there and um, continue the continue from where you left so that if your work is in in jupiter uh, if you were working on something you could go back and start working okay for sachin it's not working okay let me just make a note Okay, for Elvin also, it's not working. No worries, no worries. Okay. All right, for Sachin, it's working now. Elvin, it's not working. No worries, I'll take a look at it. One more question. For Ambari, what is the user? Name. It is same name uh, as mine. Yeah, yeah. You see the lab credentials under that. You see login. Mm -hmm. This is the login. This is your login. Yeah, okay. then I click you... on Ambari. Uh, yeah. And it presents me with a different screen where it asks me another user yeah. ID password. Right, right, right. So what you have to do is, I'll show you. Okay, let me just log out from here. Okay. So what you do is. You uh, open your my lab, okay. Uh -huh. Click on Ambari, okay, and then copy the login, paste the login here, okay, okay, okay. and then you copy your password and paste the password. Oh, got okay. it. That's all. Let me try. Right. And then click on sign in. Great. 
Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, David, for that. Because we were working, we were wondering like uh, you had a very good connectivity, and still there was something wrong. So probably it was these Nest cameras. Probably, it's a good good observation. I think. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Because that's one thing. Yeah, that, this is a good information because we were wondering like you had a very good internet connectivity, and others did not face any problem. So what could be one of the reasons? Okay, question from Sachin is, what is Ambari? Ambari is, um, wow. Ambari is basically an interface using which we can take a look at the cluster, uh, okay? And uh, see the status. And Ambari also provides various services, something called views with which we could create kind of data pipeline and other things. Okay. Ravi is not able to log in. Okay. All right. So, okay. So Hitin, is it okay to mute you? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay. All right. So what we have is, uh, okay, let me just, for Alvin and Ravi, it's not working. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, Alvin, for letting us know that it's not working in Jupyter, but it's working in, uh, it's not working in Ambari. Could you privately copy paste the password to me? I'll just change your password. Okay. All right, is anybody else facing the problem? Okay, I'll just change your password here. Yeah. All right, we all only face these kind of problems during the during the first session. Okay. Oh, this is asking for my password. Okay. Good. I'll talk about all these services one at a time. Okay, so could you try now, Alvin? I'll try for Ravi. Ravi, could you also give me a login and I could just fix your login right away. Okay, okay. Is anybody else facing the problem other than Alvin and Ravi? Okay, thank you, Ravi. Let me just fix your All right, you could try now. Great, for Elvin it's working and uh, you can also give it a try. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, is anybody else facing the problem? So all we did was we just took a look at Ambari, then we will go into each service and log in once and we'll talk in details and work on these systems as we go ahead, okay? We'll also talk about how to set up this kind of environment for yourself, if you want to do that. Great, is it working, uh, Ravi, for you? Should we move ahead? Now. Uh, no, Sandeep. Okay, okay. Let me take a look at it uh, just after the session. All right. Okay, so I have two to-dos to do. Okay, let me just save the to-dos for the course. And this is 3rd February. Wonderful. Okay, so let me go here, 3rd February. That's it. All right, Ravi, you could mute. Yeah. 
all right wonderful wonderful to have all of you in the session now the next thing is the hue okay so we have ambari and the hue for you it is going to uh, show you the login password okay so if you go here and uh, go to hue it's going to show you the login just copy paste the login copy paste the password and i'll talk about what is hue in a minute so we talk later and do first okay <clears throat> all right so what was ambari ambari was a way to look at the network what's going on how many hosts are there how many computers are there and so on okay uh, uh, sandeep uh, yes go ahead uh, i'm i'm just ch checking the hue thing for me mm -hmm. it says there are no documents available currently that's okay that's okay, okay. you could just um, yeah if you if you go here um in the beginning it would show you that um, for me, because I have been working on this, so there's mm -hmm. a lot of work. Since you have just started, there is nothing much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good question. I think that helped others also. Okay. So, all right. Are you able to all log in? David. All right. Wonderful. And Anike and Alvin. Great. Great. All right. So log into Hue. Now, what is Hue? Hue is a interface. It's like a web interface. Instead of talking to all the services through the command line or through the api like code we can talk to these hadoop services via the browser so that's what hue provides similar to ambari ambali ambari also provides you a nice web interface with which you could interact and see various services and you could also take a look at various hosts and their status that was the Ambari. Hue, Ambari is from a company called Hortonworks, while Hue is from Cloudera. And these are kind of competing products. So what we have done is we have made available both of these systems to our learners so that they can, they can uh, you know, get the taste of both worlds and they can appear for both kind of certifications. Now, Hue, Hue provides you all kinds of tools and uh, services inside it. Say, for example, you want to work on Hive, just go to Q Query Editor and click on Hive. Okay, so we'll talk about what is Hive and everything later. So here you can type in the query on Hive. If you want to interact with HDFS, you could click on File Browser. Okay, this is your HDFS file browser. Okay, the next thing is the, you could take a look at the job browser. Okay, this is where whatever job you run on Hadoop cluster, it is going to show you those. Similarly, if you want to create, create workflows, you could use the workflows. This is nothing but Uzi workflows. There is a component called Uzi. All right, so this is, this is one of the interface of, one of the interface of, uh, ecosystem provided by Cloudera to interact with various component. Okay, now the next thing is, next thing is, so it has all kinds of, you can talk to Zookeeper, Adsbase and so on. You can also talk to workflows and this is something not yet functional. Now here you can interact with Pig, Impala and everything. Okay, so this is Hue. Now, the next thing is web console. What is a web console? Oh, 
Okay, good questions. Let me answer these questions. These are very, very important questions. A question from Rajan is, you mentioned that Ambari and Hue are competing products. Typically in a company, will they just use either Ambari or Hue or they will use both? Yes, you are right. Typically in a company, either they will tie up with Cloudera or Hortonworks and hence they will either use Hue or Ambari. Okay, it would be rare that they would use both. Okay, because we took a lot of pain in actually making Hue run on top of uh, the installation from Hortonworks. Okay, so to make both of them work together, we took some amount, it took some amount of effort. Now, the next question is from Sachin. What is the difference between Ambari and Hue? Ambari is from Cloudera Hortonworks and Hue is from Cloudera. These are, Ambari is open source and so is Hue. Ambari is basically designed bottom up for provisioning the cluster. While Hue is, so Ambari is like sysadmins tool, while Hue is engineer, scientist, analyst, and Hue is for everybody. Though Ambari is trying to add features which will open it up for all kinds of users, but it's not there yet. So though there are something called Ambari views, those are quite useful, uh, but people are not using them much. Question from Hiten, so Hue and Ambari are equivalent by different vendors, kind of they are, principally both of them aspire in the same direction. They both want to become the, the data pipelining and the, the, the data engineers tool, okay? Question from Noor is, what is Cloudera Manager then? Cloudera Manager is only for installation, okay? So what Ambari is trying to do is, Ambari is trying to do both Cloudera Manager plus Hue. Cloudera Manager is a way to install the cluster. Question from Subhu, Ambari has dashboard and services in GUI. Can we see the same in Hue? Yeah. So Hue does not provide you a way to see the cluster. Here in Hue, it provides the nice, uh, nice interface with, to interact with various tools in the ecosystem. Okay, you have file manager to talk to Hadoop file system. Then you have job browser to see what are your jobs running in the cluster and so on. Okay, we'll talk about these again. So kind of there are more tools with Hue than Ambari as of now, but both are kind of trying to do the same thing. Okay. All right. So great, great. Subhu, was I able to answer your question? All yes, right. indeed. Okay, wonderful. All right. So now next, next thing is, um, this is done. Now, the other important part is console. Web console is an integral part of ecosystem. What is a console? Console is a place where you type your commands, type your commands, okay, here. Okay, so you, you might have to log in like this. So this is a Unix console. What is a Unix console? It provides us a prompt and prompt is nothing but a something called shell. So here you can interact with the whole Unix system. Right now I'm logged into e.cloudxlab.com. This is a server, Unix server. Okay. Okay. So a question from Bintao is, uh, is related to Ambari. Why are not their query editor with Ambari? They are there, but they are quite uh, not in a good shape. I will, I can try to show you. I, I remember there was something called views and we could go into the views and, and so on. Let me just show you. So there is something called here files views, for example. So you could click on the files views, okay, and interact with Hadoop file system. 
okay but i'm not sure if this works uh, very i'm not very confident about ambari okay so i would prefer that you use the hue because they are not yet uh, very uh, in a in a form that we could use okay all right now good good question so you could try those views and if it works out for you let us know i have not tried much the the ambari views yet all right so uh, here is an important point a question from grishma is can we do all kinds of data querying using hue mostly yes Uh, yes, that's right, Noor. That's how you can uh, in interpret it. So Ambari is mostly like system admins, but Hue is for development. Okay, but here the Ambari is also trying to provide views that are for the development. Okay, as uh, Bintao is saying that it is, it does work for us within Vue. Okay, great, great. So yes. Good. Wonderful. So, so what we have is a web console. The web console is another UI. So when you click on web console, new terminal will appear like this. And please note that while we type the password here or copy paste the password, nothing will appear. Okay, so please log into Web Console. It's an important exercise. Okay. So Web Console does the things that people used to do using SSH or Putty. So we have made it available using uh, Web Console in the browser. Are you able to log in? So when you please note that while you are typing or copy pasting the password, not even the asterisks will appear. All right. So is there a difference between terminal and uh, web console? No, basically it's the same thing. Just the web console is a terminal in the browser. Question from Sachin, how to copy to web console? You, um, you can just uh, press uh, control shift V or control V, it should work. So copy here and paste it here. While you are typing the password, right? Nothing would appear, so don't worry, okay? So while you are typing the password, the or pasting the password, nothing will appear, not even the asterisks. So in Unix, when you are typing something as a password, it doesn't echo, not even the asterisks or anything. It doesn't echo, all right? So sometimes it gives you an impression that it's not being able to copy paste. So all you need to do is just copy and paste and press enter. If the copy paste is not even working on login, then uh, so the, the, you have to copy paste login then password. If the copy paste is not working on login, then please type the login and the password. Gaurav, is it not working on even the login? 
great so sachin is also lo- able to log in ah uh, i see i see are you on uh, which which windows are you on uh, gara which uh, system are you on linux or windows or mac i see so for you even the copy pasting the login is not working right oh i see even the login the login also did not work okay so p- password it doesn't show you anything so it gives you an impression that nothing is happening so you just paste and press enter okay so passwords do not echo in unix and that's why it gives you an impression that it's not being pasted so it must be happening it's just that it's not echoing all right it's not showing that something has been pasted but in password it does work you just paste and press enter i see so putty is uh, different because there the login is provided to putty not to the console okay but this one is strictly like coming from, this password prompt is from unix so unix password prompts are such that the password doesn't uh, show try again just copy paste to the password and press enter it would be copying all right is everybody able to log in in the terminal great so gaurav is able to log in wonderful all right everyone alvin alok aniket bintao david gaurav godwin Grishma, Hitendra, Kartikeyan, Noor, Rajan, Ravi, Robin, Sachin, Shravanti, Subhu. All right, wonderful. wonderful uh, that you are able to all log in should we move on now all right so now what we have is um, this good so the console basically uh, is for typing the commands this is the the most powerful way of talking to any component whether you are analyst dba business uh, as in the business uh, manager or or you are from data science you are a data, data engineer whatever background is you are from the console is going to be the home for you it's going to be the most powerful way of interacting with hadoop okay or spark or running any data science systems or doing any any kind of processing the console is with console you could do everything there could be some services that are not yet accessible from you but there would be almost every service can be accessed from the command line okay almost everything could be achieved from the command line 
okay you could interact with any tool using the command line so make yourself comfortable with this okay so this is standard unix system so how many of you are not aware of unix system please yeah please raise your hand so that will be easy for me so how many of you are not aware of unix system you have never worked on unix system before So it looks like everybody is aware of Unix system. Okay. I see, I see. Okay. A question from Hitendra is, is CloudX Lab big data environment on Hortonworks or Cloudera? What we did was, we first installed the entire ecosystem using Ambari, which is from Hortonworks. And then whatever components we needed from Cloudera, the extra components, we installed those. That means you got both best of both worlds, Hortonworks and Cloudera. Plus we installed the other utilities such as Web Console, console and we installed Jupyter, which is for data science and machine learning. And it is available to all of you, okay? So the all, all of the libraries are available to all of you, with, and all the analytics tools are also available to all of us, okay? Because we realize that people who are coming from to work on CloudX Lab, they are from various interesting background. Some of them want to work with R and Hadoop. Some of them want, want to work with Scala and Hadoop. They, some of them want to work with machine learning and Hadoop and so on. So we kept all the tools available for all our our learners. Okay, so the tools, all of these tools are available to all of the learners. Question is, is this common environment for all or isolated for each? So this is a common environment for all, but your data is kind of isolated, except for your data in Hive, which is visible to others, but Rest, your home folder is yours, okay? But do not keep any private data in CloudX Lab, okay? If it is confidential or very personal, do not keep it because our sysadmins, our sysadmins continuously review the content. And in case we find something ob objects, objectionable, we generally uh, raise a red flag, okay? So, so do not keep anything personal. And uh, and this is a learning environment or pro proof of concept environment. So yeah, that's right. CloudX Lab is a hybrid. Okay, further question is, what is the difference between Apache Hadoop and Cloudera? So let me just do a recap and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead with these to topics. Okay, I'll, I'll just answer these questions in like five minutes, okay? I'll just uh, answer the general questions uh, in five minutes. Now, question from Subu is whatever installed in Hortonworks can be seen in. Uh, yes, you can interact with that in Hue. Okay, question from Binta, how to run PySpark in Jupyter Notebook. Okay, good. I'll, I'll talk about this and uh, I'll have to take a look at how to make it work. So, here you are in the web console. Uh, web console is done for all, right? All right. Now, next tool is Jupyter. Okay. So some of us, uh, all right, let me just show you the console a bit. Okay. Let me just show you the console a bit. This is the standard Unix console. Okay. Here you can type command like present working directory. You get the home folder here. Okay, and here you can interact with any tool. You can talk to Hive by typing commands like Hive. You can talk to Hadoop using Hadoop FS. And you can talk to say Python, just type Python and you can get started with Python. If you want to start working with Scala, just type Scala. If you want to type work, work with R, you can just say R. Okay, and you can start working with R, okay. And let's say you want to work with pig, just type pig, okay? You want to work with uh, Spark with Py, Python, you could just say PySpark, okay? 
and I'm just canceling it. Okay, and you could you could essentially talk to the entire ecosystem from here. Similarly, you could use any standard Unix command. Okay, like ls and so on. Okay, now, so this was um, our Unix console. We, I will go into a bit of more details about this. Now, the next very important component that we have recently introduced is Jupyter. So you can just click on Jupyter, click on Jupyter, okay. Okay, Web Console is not part of Hortonworks Cloud Era. It's a part of uh, our own ecosystem. Okay, this is something which we have added to it. Okay. So, all right, ideally people use a command called SSH or PuTTY. Instead of uh, SSH or PuTTY, we have made the Web Console available to you. Okay, so you can, if you are in a production environment, you can get the same experience by using, by installing a software on your machine called PuTTY, or uh, if you are on Mac or Linux, you will have SSH command. Okay, all right. Now, like coming back to Jupyter, you just click on Jupyter and this kind of screen will show, uh, or login password will show. Let me just log out and then show you how it looks like. All right, so you could just click on Jupyter and copy paste your login and password here, and then sign in. All right, is Jupyter working for all of you? Okay, great. So Jupyter is a very useful tool. So when you go to uh, right console, not many people are very comfortable with console. It's a little dark and the, you have to all the time type things. Here, you could interact with any Linux system from the browser. So here, you will have to type command to interact with the file system. Here, it provides you the file system. This is not, please note that this is not Hadoop file system. This is the file system of e.cloudexlab.com. It's the local machines. It's the local, because we have provided you this server whereby it's a server on the cloud. So this data is in your home folder on the cloud that we have provided. Okay. The, you also have a home folder in Hadoop file system. So you got two file systems. One is Hadoop file system and other is your local home folder. Okay, so this is where I have kept some programs. Okay, now uh, Jupyter is a very powerful tool and using Jupyter you could interact with Python, R, and you can also interact with Scala. You could also open a terminal here. Terminal, if, you do, if you're not able to open this, not log in here, try opening the Jupyter's terminal. This is also quite useful. So Jupyter is kind of interface to various uh, standard utilities of Linux. Okay, so using this, you could just uh, uh, interact with bash, whatever command you were typing there, you could type here, like ls command in Linux, you could just say, see here. Okay, and you could say pwd. So same thing, whatever you were doing in the terminal, it provides a nice interface here. Okay, so, so what we have is bash, Python 3, R, and so on. So you could, you could do all kinds of machine learning things from here. All right. So, yeah. Good. So, so these are the various services. We will, we will go into, we'll interact with all of these more and more. And uh, this is how we get started as a thumb rule. Uh, what we are going to do is we are going to do things before we talk about theory, okay, as a thumb rule. All right. Okay, so before going here, I wanted to talk about the Hadoop ecosystem.
So from web console, we are directly logging to Hadoop servers, not really. You are lo logging to a Unix machine, which is on the cloud. This, using this machine from the cloud, you can use the Hadoop commands to talk to Hadoop servers, okay? David says that the, my bash is forbidden. I see. Uh, could you could you just click on Jupiter again in the beginning and then then see is it working? So Jupiter is kind of interface to Linux. Okay. All right, great. Yes, we have Hadoop client utilities on these machines. That's correct, Noor. So here we have things like Hive. Hive is a utility to talk to Hive. And we have, uh, what do you say? Hadoop FS, that's utility to talk to Hadoop file system. Then we have Uzi to talk to, one com com component called Uzi, we have Pig to talk to pig and so on. All right, so this was a quick overview of the tools and things we have. We'll talk about MySQL later. And if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to just take a look at the MySQL, what you can do is uh, type a command like MySQL like this. So, okay, so here, let me just give this command to everyone, okay? So you could just uh, type this command, MySQL, and the password is, this time the password is different. The password is this, okay? If you are learning SQL, okay? Oh, it did not work. No, it did not work. Let me try again. Okay, so did it, oh, I copied the user, not password. No, I'm going to try it again. This time it worked, okay? So here we have show databases, okay? These many, so we'll have to use the scoop X DB. The password for MySQL is here, okay? In the MySQL tab, okay? Wonderful, wonderful set of questions. So this was the way we start with the various components. Now, since you have all the tools, 24 by seven to you, you can start working on these tools, okay? Wherever, you, whatever you want to experiment, feel free to experiment. You won't be able to damage things much, okay? Okay, just keep in mind that do not run something which is very computationally intensive that you won't be able to do unless you you do it purposefully so you will know that part but by mistake you won't be able to de damage anything okay so feel free to experiment okay the only thing that you will remember and learn is the hands-on you do and the questions you ask okay keep that in mind and All right, no matter how great I'm teaching, the truth is that when you are doing things only then you'll be able to uh, remember and experiment and then enjoy the learning, okay? All right, wonderful, wonderful to have all of you in the session, great. Now, so what we talked about in the last session, I'll just go over that. Uh, before uh, going anything. So what we talked about in the last session, in the session one, was that big data is data, data for which we need distributed computing. And distributed computing is something that needs to be executed on many computers, okay? Right now, we have not shown you any such example which is being executed on multiple machines, but I can show you that in here, in my, Okay, I can show you later probably at, at some other point. So 
big data is nothing but something that requires distributed computing. So this course that you are attending is about distributed computing and sometimes it is also called as high performance computing. Okay, so this course will go through all the tools and techniques, algorithms and architectures and frameworks which are related to distributed computing. Okay, and I'll be a little slow because there are people from different kind of accents from different backgrounds so so that I am clearly audible to all. All right. I'm hoping that my mother tongue influence is not too much and it is clear to people from different backgrounds say uh, okay so from different uh, part of the world. All right now so big data is a data for which we need distributed computing. Distributed computing is something for which we need many com distributed computing is computing using many computers simultaneously at the same point of time. Now, why would why do we need big data? Big data computing because there are many use cases where there is a humongous data to be processed, and that's why we need big data frameworks or tools. Okay, now. What are the various big data solutions? Either we use off the self uh, systems like Google Compute Engine, AWS, or Bluemix from IBM, or Azure for, from Microsoft, or we set up our own local cluster using Hadoop and Spark locally. Either one, the course is about Hadoop and Spark. So either you could use locally or on the cloud. Okay, now. So Hadoop was created in order to solve. Cassandra is a NoSQL database for storing and updating humongous amount of records. Okay, so just like HBase in the Hadoop ecosystem, that's also quite useful. Hadoop was created based on Google's papers, and now Hadoop has Hadoop was started with three components: a file system, a MapReduce engine, and a humongous data store, uh, a record-based data store called HBase. So that's where the Hadoop was started and soon enough it became the framework having many components. These are the various components under the umbrella of Hadoop. Okay, so, so the, the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to learn something called Jukeeper, which is not there in this ecosystem, but we learn it during the course, okay? Question from Grishma is MongoDB and Hadoop are similar. MongoDB is just kind of a database while Hadoop has everything. Hadoop has a file system, Hadoop has a, Hadoop has a operating system, a distributed operating system called Yarn, and then there are many frameworks, okay? So Hadoop is a humongous system while MongoDB is just a NoSQL data store, okay? Couchbase is like MongoDB, okay? So Couchbase, Couchbase, MongoDB, what are they? They provide you a way to store complex objects, okay, at a place, but the custom computation or file storage is really hard using MongoDB. Though MongoDB does provide you with the, with the file system, but But the file system is going to be in kind of a database. So it's not very, very um, flexible and as powerful as the Hadoop goes. All right. Now, so these are the various components of Hadoop, Hadoop ecosystem. You must go through these components uh, in the past session. And these are the various components uh, with which we will be interacting. There, there are a few more components which are not included here. Okay. What are those components? The components such as Jukeeper. Components such as Jukeeper. Jukeeper is not yet included here. So we will go into the Jukeeper. Uh, uh, I mean, because Jukeeper is not dependent on Hadoop. It's an independent software, but it is very much required. So we have added Jukeeper. All right. Now, this is the here we have described all components and then here is the use case okay 
A question from Noor. Hadoop, is Hadoop not installed on top of Linux? It is installed on top of Linux. Okay. Now, uh, there was a question called, what is the difference between Apache Hadoop and Cloudera? Correct. So, so Hadoop was basically started as open source project. It is licensed under, under uh, Apache license, which is the most flexible license. Which is the most flexible license. And uh, this license is, is what made Hadoop most popular because that gave the ability to, to use it in all environments. So, so Hadoop was created like an open source system, but there, there were some companies who pr started providing services around Hadoop. For example, the, the first company, Cloudera, was the main contributor to Hadoop. Okay, so Cloudera started with con as a service company around Hadoop. So they started providing the support and, and so on. Later on in Hadoop 2, the biggest contributor was Hortonworks uh, founder, and that's where the Hortonworks became popular. So Cloudera and Hortonworks, they provide the support for Hadoop and they provide these additional utilities and they are the biggest contributors for Hadoop and therefore, therefore they are basically the implementer for Hadoop. All right. And um, in case you want, if you don't like, say, lab, and you want to do it on your machine, the easiest way to install, there are, there are two ways, okay? One is install the, the virtual machine, okay? So you could always search for, say, Hortonworks VM, okay? So you can just download the sandbox from here, all right? And, um, okay, or you could just download Cloudera, Cloudera VM, either of them. You could just download and install it on your local machine. Okay, so it kind of, instead of installing on your local machine, every component, they have provided you a virtual box, which you can install. Okay, you can use either this one. All right, now, in case you would like to, that this is the way to install on a desktop. This is strictly for learning purposes, but it, there are many complications installed. There are many complications involved in installation, such as the BIOS sometimes does not allow you to install virtual machines and so on. There is a huge download. It takes a long time to download uh, Hortonworks or Cloudera. So therefore, therefore we have set up the lab so that you don't have to worry about any of this. In case you're planning to set up your own environment like ours, you could use Hortonworks Ambari, okay, to install install the entire cluster. Okay, so all right. So you could use the this 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 PDF file to guide you through the installation. Okay, it's a, it's a really nice installation. So you could use this in detail, all right? So in, in summary, in case you are trying to install on the cluster, use Zambari, or you could also use Cloudera Manager, okay? The way we have done is we have installed the entire thing using Zambari and then added the indi individual services from both the world. Because the other way around wasn't possible, Okay, if you are trying to install on single machine, you can use virtual machines, but yes, these are standalone configuration. There are no distributed computing. That's correct, Gaurav. So yes, so if you're installing the virtual machines, you will be using only one computer. But in our case, in our case, if you take a look at Ambari, we have seven servers running for you so that when you will do any computing, it will actually utilize those seven computers. So you will get a feel of 
what it means by distributed computing. Okay, so if you take a look at the host, there are seven active hosts. And one is deactive, so we generally shut it down whenever the work is not needed. A question from Yitendra, how all of these components can be downloaded for free? All of these components are open source and free. Okay. Why we charge for the lab? Why we charge for the lab is because, uh, because we need to pay to AWS and other service providers. Question from Noor is, what is the cheapest way to run our own ecosystem in the cloud? The cheapest way is probably either using AWS or Google Cloud Platform. Okay, that's the cheapest way. Great. So great. So this is the this is how it looks like. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we talked about quite a few things just now. We talked about. A question from Grisham. The AWS is similar to Hue and Ambari. No, AWS is kind of completely different game. It's on cloud. They provide you the computer, the, the entire machine on which you could install many things. Okay. AWS is Amazon Web Services. Okay. So they provide all kinds of things and that is from Amazon. All right. So Hadoop has various components. We will go into details of each component later on. And this was the use case of Uzi in which you are showing that in a typical project, in a typical Hadoop project, you will utilize multiple component. Then we talked about Apache Spark. Apache Spark is basically a replacement of MapReduce, not Yarn, not HBase, not file system. It is the replacement of one of the components. Okay. And Spark has got its own ecosystem. We will go into the details of these components as we go ahead. All right. So that's what we had talked in the first session. So in the first session, we talked about big data. What is big data? And uh, why do we need uh, why and house of big data? This, the use cases. Then we talked about Hadoop ecosystem. Then we talked about Spark ecosystem. All right. Those are the things that we discussed in the first session. Now. Today, let's just uh, get started with the, the Linux part of it. Techion is a file system. It is changed to something else. It's called Eluxure. Okay, Eluxure. Eluxure, yeah, this is the one. Okay, it has changed to... Okay, let me just put it here. Okay. All right, but, but that one is doesn't look like uh, open source. Now, great. So these are things we talked about. Now let's move on. All right, the first and most important thing to learn is Linux. Okay, the three, three pillars the, on the pillars of knowledge in IT, the first one is knowledge of Linux. Second one is knowing any programming language. Third one is knowing the SQL. The three things are quite important. All right, so, so let's try to understand the Linux part. The rest we will talk about as we go ahead. Okay, so it's an introduction on Linux. It's basically, the Linux is everywhere. Linux is on car, in, in your car, in your mobile phone. Android is nothing but Linux in the fridge and in your watch. So Linux is everywhere. Linux is a very powerful, powerful operating, operating system and it is really, really tiny and it can run on all kinds of devices. Okay, so Linux operating system, there are three components, programs, kernel and shell. And this is the in, in Linux, everything is a file system. This is how you can visualize the file system. At the top, this is slash. 
the child folder of this slash is tmp this is another folder so file system has two things folder and file correct that's what we have seen in windows similarly in case of linux also it has folders and files but unlike windows in which you have on the top you have c colon d colon e colon and so on here there is always a singular file system the top is always slash under this there are many folders and files in linux there are only in linux everything is a file okay except for folders everything is a file now even the device like hard disk is a file the mouse is a file sound card is a file and uh, and even the process details are kept in the file now question from binta is what's the difference between linux and unix unix was basically linux is was the open source software be built on the same principles as unix okay built the design was very much similar basically same design as unix but open source so linux and unix we will use interchangeably okay and uh, okay david's question is should i know linux sql and what was another one answer is any programming language okay so in this course towards the end after the hadoop finishes we will start with the scala and that will be quite useful to you okay and so so linux file system looks like this every user has got a home folder under slash home directory and folder are same things okay so let me just okay and that's why if you have never used linux make sure you finish this particular course you go to my courses then you click on start here okay and inside this you click on start now okay here you'll find a detailed set of steps and do not miss out anything okay this course is going this course is an exhaustive linux course and it's going to teach you a lot about linux okay so linux basically is everywhere the data centers and data scientists data engineers data analysts and everybody uses linux so it's very important to get used to linux okay so this is how the linux file system looks like and uh, we can connect to the linux web console by using either the web console or using ssh or using the putty on windows okay so let's go through uh, do a quick okay a question from vinta is is there a special rule to name linux file system so basically in linux if you are creating a folder or file okay do not put a space in in the file name or folder name okay if you are putting the space in the folder name or file name put double quotes around the name okay all right so you must go through this question uh, the the course that we have talked about on linux fundamentals but i'll just go through um, very simple ones and okay we'll talk about this portion a bit later okay so you can log in into cloudex lab web, web console type who am i okay let me just start here okay this is my web console this is where we type the unix commands all right the first command you might want to try is who am i what is who am i who am i is a program which when run displays your login name this is the prompt this is the prompt okay it shows that this is your login name this is the internal ip address of this machine and this is the current folder current folder is nothing but a folder in which you are right now standing you can change this current folder using a command called 
change directory cd okay so let's say if i say cd slash tmp meaning i want to go to the top level and under there that or, or let me just put it slash that means i want to go to the top level okay let me go to the top level now if i say present working directory my present working directory is different okay while who am i meaning my login remains the same correct now to take a look at various folders you could just always say ls ls gives you the list of files or folders if you want to see the details about it you could say ls and space and dash l the format of any command is command followed by space followed by arguments okay here our arguments is dash l that means we want to see the list of files okay so here you can see the permissioning you can see the size you can see the login and the user the group and so on using this you could control the permission using the C various commands so there are many commands available in linux okay now if you go to okay the first thing i did was i did cd slash okay and then i said ls dash l are you able to see it now I went to the top level directory. Okay. So all of you, while I'm talking, you must, you must uh, uh, follow it. That's why whatever I'm typing, I'm just generally speaking louder. Okay. I'm doing things slowly so that all of you could do things. Is this web console a part of ecosystem, Hadoop ecosystem? Not really. Not really. It's part of Linux. On top of Linux, we generally install Hadoop, and therefore, Linux is everywhere. Okay, so we are right now interacting with Linux. All we have done is, whatever terminal Linux provides to us when we connect to it via PuTTY or any other software, what we have done is you eliminated the installation of that software like PuTTY or SSH. Instead, we have provided everything in the browser. Okay. All right, so interact with the Linux file system. Question from Noor is, as you said, everything is a file. How do I know if a file is a program or not? Okay, let's say LS, right? So LS is basically a file. So you can always say which LS and it is saying, telling you that LS is this, which means there is, at the top level directory, there is a folder called bin, right? There is a folder called bin. I went into CD slash, meaning I went to top level directory. Then I said CD bin, okay? And if I type a command here, LS, it is showing the list of all the programs. So all of the programs here are also the file. Do you see that? Who am I is a file. Do you see that? And who is a file? Wget is a file. So the programs are also the files. Okay. A question is, is that green background files or directories are current, are the current running one? No, no. It is not showing anything running. The one that is currently running can be seen by using a command called PS. PS is a command or a program that shows you your programs that are running. Okay. If you want to see everybody's programs, you could use PX AUX. So these commands are something that you might want to get used to. So I can see that here, a sort of, then we have Philip, then we have, okay, then we have Deepan Jyoti probably, and so on, right? Okay, or we could use who, and it shows the all the users who are right now logged in, okay? 
these are the users that are currently logged in. Okay. So PSAUX is the command to show everybody's everybody's commands. All right. Wonderful to have uh, all of you in the session. I hope this is something fun. So you can see who all are logged in, right? Okay. See, Sandeep Giri is logged in twice here and here. Why? Because I think I've opened the, the here. Correct? That's why. Then we have all these users, Subu, Subu and the, so we have three servers, E, F, and G. Some of the users are logged into E. Some of users are given as F. Some of the users are given G. Okay. In case E, F is not working, you can switch to, you can change manually this to F or G. The, the data will remain same. Question from Vintao, could you have help us some typical regular expression, how to extract such as IP address, email address? Sure, sure. Okay, so question is, all right. The regular expressions. Okay, I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to plan it out. I could, I could help you out with that. Okay, actually the regular expression course we had, I'm not sure it is enabled yet to the users. Okay. Should I add the regular expression course? Regular expression course. Okay. So All right, good. So start start exploring the terminal and regular expression course, I'll just plan it out. I'll put it on my to do. Okay, now next question is when I typed who, besides our login name, what does PTS means? So every user on Unix is given a terminal. Okay, so every user is given a terminal here. Okay, so since I'm logged in from two accounts, two places, this is my terminal. These are two terminals, PTS slash 23. Every terminal is given a name. Okay, so you can always find out which terminal you are on by using a command called TTY. And here it is showing me that this is the file that represents, this is the file that represents my terminal. As I said earlier, everything is a file in Linux. Here, even the screen is a file, okay? Even the screen is a file, okay? All right, so as a strong suggestion, my, my strong suggestion would be that go through the Linux file system as Question from De Revit, my files are not available on different servers. Okay, so if you are moving from say, yeah, so that's right, but that will be, we are working on that. So what we are trying to do is your home directory, we are trying to make it available on all machines. Okay, that will be done probably in a couple of days. Okay, right now your files may not be available if you are moving between E to F and G, but probably in three days time, will be available. We are working on exactly the same thing. Okay. All right. So wonderful. Wonderful to know that. Good. Now, so a user executes a program. Angry Bird, an example. Okay. So I think I've shared this slide. Could anybody share it back? Okay, a question from Sachin is, could you let me know how to move between E and F? Okay, let me just show you. Say you open this console, right? And it's not opening. You could just change E to F, okay? And provide the login password here, simple. So that's how you could move between E and F and G. Thank you, Noor. All right. Wonderful. So here are some more trivia's that a user executes uh, programs 
Angry Bird is a program that gets executed by the kernel. Okay. When a program is launched, it creates processes. What are processes? Processes are something that keeps running, keeps getting executed, and stay in the memory. Program or process will be used interchangeably in this discussion. Okay, so in Linux operating system, the heart of the system is kernel. Kernel is the, the main work of the operating system is handled by kernel. It allocates time and memory for the programs. It handles file system, response to various calls and so on. A user interacts with the kernel via shell. The console as opened in the previous slide is the cell. Okay, user writes instructions in the shell to get executed. So this cell is basically another program which is asking us to type something. And when we type something and press enter, it takes this and finds which program to execute or which command to execute and executes that. Okay, so, so that's the duty of the shell. Okay, whatever we command we type, it interp interprets it, figures out, and then executes it. Okay, so let's take a break for 10 minutes and we will be back by 9.54 PM IST. Okay, break for 10 minutes. All right, so I'm back. And should we start now? Sorry for being one minute late. All right, wonderful, wonderful. So there was a question from Bintao. What are the functions of the directories such as TAM, TMP, BIN, etc? Okay, uh, all right. So you must go through the, here. Okay, what is the function of TMP? So what is he talking about? Let me just give you a little bit context. When we go to the top, right? This is the top folder. And then we say P here. Right, so you have these folders like TMP, there is boot, there is the, these folders and so on, right? So here, TMP is generally for temporary files. So if I go to say CD TMP and say LS DSL, so these are the temporary files created for you by this system. These temporary folders and files will disappear after the reboot. Then bin, Okay, then bin, what is bin? Bin is for storing, uh, let me go back to the top, I'll say CD bin. Bin is for storing all the binaries. Binaries means programs. Now, the ETC is generally for configuration. ETC is generally for configuration. Most of the configuration files of the Unix system are kept in slash etc. While sbin, sbin are those programs that needs root privileges, okay? Those are sbin, not subin, it's sbin, all right? So I think once you go through the Linux uh, uh, tutorial, it'll take you through the entire ecosystem. If you're not clear about that, just let me know, I could help. Wonderful, great. So, so, the question was, what is IST? IST is basically plus 5.30, okay? So it's plus five and a half hours ahead of uh, the UTC or GMT. All right, so 3.30 minutes is what it is ahead. All right, so we're just going through quickly through the Linux operating system. And uh, here, these are the basic commands. LS displays the list of files, CD changes the directory, PSSWD changes the password for the current user, but do not use do not change the password. Otherwise, on the lab it'll di display different, while the actual password will be different. 
file file name displays the type of the file with that name okay so there is a command called file which actually checks any file and tells you what is inside that file even if the extension is different it can figure out what is the content of that file okay now the next uh, uh, program is cat cat is is for concatenate cat is for displaying the content of a file so so the cat command is used to display what to display on the screen what is there inside the file and the file is specified as the first argument okay so question from binda is what is the difference between shell kernel and programs okay kernel executes shell okay shell takes commands from you and basically shell is the interface the one that you see here this is shell when you are pressing enter this is going to shell shell is taking the input from you asking kernel to execute the programs and kernel is executing the programs okay so programs are the files that contain the executable code which is executed by the kernel okay so shell is like a reception kernel is like um in a, you know how should i describe it in um okay so if i take an analogy of um, the tape recorder okay which has cassettes so the tape recorder basically is the shell which provide you interface on which you can do what you want to do which cassettes to play and kernel is that inside of the tape recorder which plays things and different tapes are the programs the web console and terminal are a shell whenever you use web console or the terminal you actually get the shell okay terminal and shell will be used interchangeably good and please note that shell is another program shell is just another program and actually i can execute say shell from here we can say bash and right now i am in the bash i if i exit from here i'll go back okay so so and similarly there are many shells when it jet uh ksh is it there oh it's not there or csh yeah no csh is also not there but sh is there so there are many kind of shells okay shells are nothing but another programs kernel executes everything okay so kernel is the main operating system good this one you have already gone through this one also you can also if you are on uh, mac or uh, you have putty or you are on linux you can also use ssh to log in into the console now the this part we have already discussed so i'm really going extremely fast because i expect you to go through the linux uh, tutorial by yourself okay so all right so this is the place where you would be playing around with the commands and here this is the so few of the commands that you keep in mind one is pwd which is present working directory cd for changing the command if you don't type anything it will take you to your home your home is everybody is provided a home folder under slash home if i go up one step how do i go up, up one step is using dot dot okay this is one step so if i say pwd my pwd is this okay if i go one more step up my present working directory has gone up okay so cd command takes you through uh, changes your present working directory into something else pwd shows the present working directory ls 
shows the files in the present working directory. Wherever you are in the project working directory, it shows the files of that one. Okay, so basically using the command, whatever you have been doing through the browser, going back, going up, going down, this here you will have to use the command in order to display the files. Okay, so then we can Okay, a question from Bintao is, what is the difference between, a good question actually, let me just answer this question. So question is, question is what is the difference between slash user, slash home, slash USR, USR within CloudX Lab? Okay, so slash home, slash home is for everybody's home directory. If I go up, I can see everybody's home directory here. I can see everybody's home directory here. There are just too many files. It's, take, it's going to take a long time to display this folder. You can see this is the list of all the files. Now, that, that's what slash home shows you. Slash user Okay, so slash home is meant for keeping everybody's local files. Slash user USER is in the Hadoop file system. Okay, this is the place where everybody's home directory is kept in the Hadoop file system. That's an entirely different file system. Okay, we'll talk about that file system soon. Slash user is, uh, again, this is where user level programs are capped okay say for example we have installed spark various versions of spark into this we just copied the program here okay java is installed here hadoop is installed here and so on okay i hope this is clear to you all right so play around with linux and this tutorial this tutorial would take you through the linux entire linux and make sure that over the week, you go through every aspect of it. There are 87 pages, but most of it is generally a quiz. Okay, so finish it. Here, the same same shell is provided inside the browser. Okay, and challenges like, there are very tiny challenges, say, create a directory. Okay, it's asking you to create a directory. So all you need to do is, create this directory and and then click on I'm done please check so it has created the directory for you okay so that way all right so make sure that you you go through this and this would definitely help you so that's that's about Linux if you have more questions um, all right. okay. a question from Noor is where is the kernel located? Is it is that a file too? So yes. So kernel is nothing but a um, bunch of files, and uh, that gets booted at the initial time. Okay. So kernel is nothing but another. Uh, basically, is loaded from the file system. Okay. Some of the kernel, basically, some of the part of the operating system is called bootloader. Bootloader starts the rest of it and uh, the the whole thing is called kernel all right but you don't need to know the exact definition of a kernel in order to use linux okay you but you you must know how to navigate around how to use cd command what does it mean by relative path and absolute path how do i find out which folder i'm interacting with and so on okay so go through that and I'm sure that you'll be able to do that. In case you have any questions, any questions you will be able to, you, you, you just drop us an email at reaches or just go to the forum and, and put your question in the forum, okay? Great, wonderful. Now, the 
if you are not comfortable with the folder structure here in the Linux, you don't like the command prompt, what you can do is you could go to my lab, go to Jupyter. Inside Jupyter, you will be able to see the folders. Same thing what you are interacting on the console. This is the same folder structure. Okay. It's the same folder structure and um, yeah. So you could create a folder using new. Here there is an advantage. If you want to upload something from your laptop to here, you can just click on upload and upload from there. Okay. So this is something that you can't do from console. Uploading the file, you will have to either use the file upload system or use something else. So if you want to upload something from your desktop to your this file system, use this. If you want to upload something to Hadoop file system, use Hue. H U E Hue is what you need to use. All right, that we will come back to soon. Wonderful. All right, so that was that was a very brief overview of the shell. A question from Bintao, is there a directory called log? Okay, can I see the log? Good question, good question. Let me just take out this into another tab so that I can switch between the terminal and this. Okay, so question is where are my logs? It's a very important question and most of the logs in the entire ecosystem is inside where and inside log. Okay, so this is where all of the logs are generally capped. You can see that the lo there are logs of MongoDB, there are logs of Nginx, there are logs of Spark, Spark, and so on. Okay, so you can find out the logs of the whole system here. Good? Is everybody comfortable? What can I do with the log? You can actually take a look at them. Let's say uh, I'm facing some problem with the, uh, let's say, um, okay, booting. So I want to find out, and there is something called messages. Messages is something very important file, important file in the, in the Unix system. So you could use, tail minus f, but since I don't have permission to it, you can't do it, you much about it. But the things that you have permission on, say last log, okay, last log generally keeps uh, the, who all have logged in past. Then if you want to take a look at Kafka logs, you can take a look at the Kafka and why something is failing. Okay, so that way, and yes. So most of the services keep the log in the where folder and that's where you could generally log in and see. Great, great. Did I answer your question, Bintao? These are very important questions and these are very important questions. The, 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 be, the, the quicker you answer the question, the better you'll get them. Okay, question from Noor. Is there a visual way of looking at logs? Good question, good question. So um, we have not yet installed that utility here on the CloudX lab, but there are, there are many utilities which are specifically designed for parsing the log and understanding the logs. But there is no as such visual way in the Linux to visualize the log. Okay, so, uh, okay. A question from Binta is, after my trying your command, my screen looks like messed up. Yeah, whenever you take a binary program, binary file, and try to print it, what happens is it garbles the screen. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to just close the terminal, log in again. A question from Sachin is, can you please tell where the kernel file is located? 
okay so the kernel files are basically located at uh, you know the the bootloader part okay and i'll tell you so here you have most of the user base data and kernel is nothing but a bunch of uh, libraries here so you, you could take a look at all kinds of modules all of these modules actually comprise of the kernel and okay so there is a folder called boot which has the details about the kernel okay so this vm lineage is generally considered as kernel all right Okay, a question is how do I know about kernel version? There is a Unix command called uname, uname dash a, that shows the entire details about the kernel. Okay. All right. And so you can press control L at any point of time to clear the screen. Okay, or type C clear command. Okay. Question from Robin, what is the command to show event logs beside user logs? Okay, so there you have to go through the where log and take a look at which, which one we are looking at. The event logs are generally inside the messages. Okay. And this message is generally secure and is only available to the root. Okay. If you if you want to take a look at the system level activities, you will have to take take a look. Okay. Okay. Question from David is that ENV is useful. That that's right. Thank you. So you can also take a look at the whole environment. So there is something called environment variables. As soon as you log in. Those variables are initialized. When you launch a program, those variables are made available to you. Those are called environment variables. So environment variables are basically set of key value pairs that keep on going around. Okay, good, good. An env command shows the environment variable. All right, I hope I was able to answer your questions. Great. Were you able to clear up with now? Okay. How to set an environment variables? You can use either the export command. Okay. Right. So this is the syntax. Set and env command do the same thing. Great, great set of questions. All right. So I would want all of you to go through the Linux, Linux tutorial and finish that one. Go to my courses and. Oh, okay. A further question is how to set environment variables per permanently. What you have to do is you need to know a couple of more things. Okay. When a user logs in into the Unix or the terminal, what happens is the, the file called dot bash profile is is launched. Okay. Like bash profile or bash RC, these files are launched. So you can export the way I'm setting this path variable here. You can export this in your file called dot bash profile. And then that variable will be set every time you lock in. Okay. So that was a quick way. If you want to set some variable for all the users, you could use, you could use etc profile file there all the commands in that are executed for all the users in the beginning. Okay, so that was a quick overview of Linux. All right, should we? 
should we move ahead so uh, i'll answer this more question what is the functionality of bash so bash is the one which interact with the user okay bash is a program that takes the command from the user and get that thing get that command executed that's the duty of bash okay yes bash is a shell if your bash underscore profile is empty that means uh, you can all add whatever to it all right you can create a new one no worries by default you will have no bash profile okay that's all all right so keep tinkering around your uh, linux environment if you are not able to linux log in or you have screwed up your linux environment just let us know we will fix it okay if your if your linux environment goes bad because you were experimenting with the environment variables or something like that please let us know we'll get it fixed okay but but that should not be causing a hesitation in trying all kind of things okay honestly i have learned linux by just trying to tamper with it okay all right wonderful so moving ahead great great should we start with jukeeper everyone A question from Alok is: Is there a way to recover from rm minus rf command? Uh, all right, very hard question. Quick answer is no. The long answer is: Some of the data could be recovered if you have not further changed things, but it generally no. Okay, but since you don't have the root permissions, you won't be able to do that system-wise damage. You would only be able to damage your own files. Okay. A question from Robin is: I accidentally mistyped this. Okay, no worries. So it won't have any impact. All right, and just okay. Just press Control X and either say no, then you will be able to exit. All right. Wonderful. Great. Great. So the first component that we would like to interact with is Jukeeper. There will be a bit of theory, and then we'll go hands-on. All right. So all right. So let's jump in. So so while we are doing this course, we will also learn the industry terminology. We'll also learn a couple of very familiar concepts for most of us, but for some of us, those concepts may not be familiar. So that's why we have included those terminologies. The first such terminology is the race condition. How many of you know what is race condition? Has anybody anybody heard of the term called race condition? Okay. All right. So what is a race condition? Let me explain. Imagine, imagine that there is a bank. Okay. And this bank, there is a bank account of a person and there are two persons, a husband and wife, A and B. They both are trying to deposit $1 into this bank account. Okay, so person A and person B both are trying to deposit one dollar into this account, and what they did was they basically 
did this deposit of money at the exact same second or same millisecond. So if there is a program which is suffering from race condition, what would happen is, how will it work? It will read the current account value, increase by one, and then save, right? What if, what if both of them read 17, both of them increased it, and then both of them saved it as 18. So you can see that even though $2 were deposited into the account, but there has been only an increase of $1. Why is it so? Because both of them read the same value, okay? Therefore, two, two commands or two programs are kind of racing with each other racing with each other and hence end up corrupting the data. End up corrupting the data. So, all right. So question from David is, how is it different from database locking? We'll talk about deadlock in a minute. Probably that's what you're referring. So, Race condition is generally solved by locking the rows or locking the database, okay? So in a way that database locking and race condition sometimes refer like that. Okay, very good questions. Noor's question is, I think it's called dirty read. Yes, this is also called dirty read, as in while something is being committed or changed, the other person read, read the same thing. Okay, this is also called dirty read. Now, Sachin's question is, can we declare static variables in Java? Yes, we can declare static variables in Java. So uh, can, can I uh, take the questions related to Java later? Okay, so do you mean that this can be, this can happen because of static variables in Java? Is that your question? Okay, Grishma's question is, is the versioning used here? Here, the, there's no concept of versioning and we are just, there is a program that reads from a file or database and these, the same program is running on two separate servers at the same time and basically reading the data from the account and updating it back. So both of them read the data from database, changed it and updated. Okay, so you will be amazed to know that, that a number of programs suffer from race conditions. A lot of Unix systems or Windows systems, they all suffer from race conditions. Race conditions are the hardest problems to solve when it comes to the computing, okay? In my, in my career, there have been many times the race conditions go unnoticed even till the production, okay? Even after multiple code reviews, multiple testing, the race conditions are not that visible during the testing, okay? And they are hardest problems to solve because the moment you are trying to debug it, the problem won't occur, okay? But when you are in production, there are multiple threads, multiple processes trying to compete for the same resources, then these problems would occur, okay? So is everybody clear about the race conditions? Two processes competing for the same resource. Two processes racing for the same resource is called race condition. All right. Now, the next question to you is, what is the deadlock? What do we mean by a deadlock? Anybody? Competing for same resource means here, 
Okay, let me just go back one step. There's a question from Hitend. Question from Hitend is, competing from same resource, what does it mean? Okay, it means, say these two processes, one process is this, other process is this. Whenever a person is interacting with a server, a process will be created on the server side. This process or the program is also modifying and reading the same, same database, okay? So this is called, this is called race condition. Now question is what is de deadlock? Okay, yes. One process is waiting which is held by another, correct. Situation where two or more threads are blocked forever waiting for each other. That's right, David. Question from Alok, the other guy is also waiting the resource held by the first guy, correct. Again, just like race conditions, deadlocks are really difficult to debug, okay? And really difficult to figure out in a program, okay? In most of the testing scenarios, they don't occur. And in the production, they might occur when there are multiple users. So take a case of this one. So here, is it screen frozen? Okay, great, great. Now, take a look at this traffic. This is a typical scenario of Bangalore, okay? Here, what you have is there are four lanes, okay? The four lanes are coming here. And here, what you see is there is no red light. So what's happening is this car is waiting for this, this car is waiting for this, this car is waiting for this, and so on. So they will wait forever. Okay, unless somebody intervenes. So this is called a deadlock. Similarly, in case of programs, what is when does deadlock happen? When process one is waiting for process two, process two is waiting for process three, and process three is again waiting for process one. This might look, this might look like, this might look like, um, this might look like an impossible scenario, but you'll be amazed that a lot of programs suffer from deadlock. And yes, my programs have also suffered deadlock. I thought that it's like one of the most impeccable code. And in the production, the deadlock did occur. Okay, so deadlocks occur very frequently in the programs, just like race conditions. Okay, every, every cell script or every, most of the scriptings are prone to race conditions and the deadlocks are mostly visible in the situations where there are transactions such as databases. So it won't take too long, it will take forever, okay? It will take forever to, for a deadlock. Deadlock means it'll be stuck forever, okay? Now, so we talked about two things. One is race condition and other is deadlock. Now I'm going to give you a scenario and this is a very important aspect that how would email processors avoid reading the same email? Okay, let's take a look. Let's say there is an inbox. There's an inbox having lot of emails. Okay, this inbox having lot of emails and you have written this wonderful program called email processor all it does is it reads the email from an inbox, okay? And does some kind of process. Maybe it's trying to index the email or make it searchable or something like that. Or maybe it is just figuring out if the email is a spam or not, okay? Now, there are multiple email processors and they are trying to read the emails. Okay, now the only thing they can do is these email processors do is they can mark an email read and unread. These are the only things they can do. Okay, these are the only things they can do and they can't delete or archive the emails. They can only do mark. Okay, so this inbox is kind of read only. The inbox is kind of read only and the email processors are supposed to work on many computers. So this email program 
is the same program running on three machines. First machine, second machine, third machine. Okay, and this same processor is basically, this processor is going to read the email and, and, and process it. Remember that whatever code you write, here will be replicated on all machines. Whatever logic you write here will be running on other machines. Question to all of you is that in such scenario, what kind of program will you build? What kind of logic will you build so that no email is escaped and no email, no email is escaped and no email is processed twice? So Alok's suggestion is by using flag read unread. So while an email one is processing, it's, it'll start reading this one. Will mark it read or, or it will not mark it as read. You can't put a lock on the email. The in inbox is not providing us the lock. So if you let's say mark it red, what will happen is, what if this processor dies in between? This email will be marked as red and nothing has been processed. And therefore, therefore, this email will be left in the inbox. Unprocessed. Okay. So let's say, let's take a case of a flag on the email saying red. Let's say the inbox provided red and red. Okay, so email processor came to email one, started processing it. Processing takes time. And you have to keep in mind that during the processing, this process might die. So you have to keep that in mind while processing the inbox. Because what would happen is in case this one this email processor marked this email as done before even finishing the process, then this email will be left and will never be processed in case this processor died in between while processing an email. Right, Hitendra? If it marked it as processed and the processor died, it will be unprocessed and then there will be nobody will, that email will be skipped. Question from Noor is, there should be some kind of manager that processor should be talking to. Correct. There should be some kind of manager that processor should be talking to. Okay. If there is, let's say a router or something, then the process will become easier. But again, that router will become the bottleneck. The router will become the bottleneck. A question from Grishma. Some buffer where emails will be put when processor is on an email. That's right. That's also one of the solutions. Okay. Workload manager that efficiently distributes work on various worker threads. Good. Okay, so again, that manager will become the bottleneck. A question from Sachin is, how Zookeeper help in deadlock? We will get this. Okay, we will get this. Question from Jay is, can we have a way where two processes cannot enter the read section together? Yes. Okay, that's what we are trying to figure out. Good, very good set of answers and questions. Okay, okay. So yes, so this is our first interaction with distributed computing. Okay, so if we have a router, then if email process is running on say 100 machines, then router will become the bottleneck, right? And so on. There are, there are, there are these kind of scenarios in, in the distributed computing. All right. So a general way is, general way is, I mean, honestly, the this one. So in in my product in the in the previous to previous company where we I built Tbits Global, 
the the company which is specialized in the document management systems what we were doing is we were reading the inbox and then updating the system that was called two way email integration so so there we were running this processor and the processor was again and again going into deadlock okay so this scenario is quite quite common okay this situation is quite common now since they are running on multiple machines the the locks that are provided by the operating system are no longer valid okay the locks that are provided by processes are no longer valid because they are on different machines and therefore we need what we need is we need is a central storage a central storage where whoever is doing what whatever is putting it in the central storage and then then and before starting to process something they go and check here okay they go and check here and while while on the timestamp they also put things like things like um the current timestamp okay current time so that if the email processor dies and this entry is there after a certain point of time we should be able to delete it okay so email processor goes here checks an entry and uh, let's say for for the emails available here checks the entry in case nobody is is taking it up or in case the one who has taken it up but has died died long back and this entry has expired in that case it will basically pick it up so th these email processors will use this storage central storage as the this central storage for for coordination okay email processor came started processing email 1 made an entry here saying i am processing email 1 nobody touches it okay email processor 2 comes in and takes a look at both this and this and says okay since email 1 is being processed by this guy i'll pick up email 2 okay and make an entry here that hey i am using email 2 but nobody touches it okay then email processor 3 comes in and sees that okay the first two are still busy are being processed by the others therefore let me just process the email 3 now let's say if bill processor one died after some time at that point of time the next email processor would have to take a look at the, this data and delete the entries which are pretty old okay that means those records have been abandoned and hence maybe the processor had died long back this is just left over okay yes question from nore do you think this is also a bottleneck correct this is the limiting factor this is the limiting factor because all the processors have to interact with single storage right and this is where this is where the systems like jukeeper come into play so jukeeper this is this part this part okay jukeeper is this part and so a question from subu is that is it does it uses uh, round robin kind of it uses round robin it just picks up from here checks whatever is is being processed and so on and once it's done that email processor marks email as done and so on okay so all we are trying to do is we are trying to figure out the best way of coordinating between the multiple computers using a central storage okay so the same can be can be achieved using a database using a normal relational database this can be achieved but as noor is suggesting that this could become the bottleneck this indeed will become a bottleneck if these processors are running on hundreds of machines if these processors are running on hundreds of machines then there will be hundreds of calls to this storage per millisecond or so and hence this will become the bottleneck okay this is exactly where the jukeeper comes into play jukeeper makes the coordination between various services okay so jukeeper provides you a set of very simple things like set and get 
okay very simple storage with which you can easily program to and it uses a data model like a directory tree okay so zookeeper zookeeper is essentially a kind of central storage central storage to which all the programs from the network can keep some amount of data specifically for coordination so it's the distribution distributed coordination service for distributed application this application is distributed this application is distributed because it's running on one computer same second computer and third computer same logic executing on multiple machines so that many emails could be processed per millisecond therefore this application is distributed and this is the role played by zookeeper with many such kind of systems many such kind of processors and this zookeeper also runs on top of many computers yes so zookeeper is a program zookeeper is a software okay which is uh, uh, one of the one of the brilliant designs in the hadoop ecosystem okay and it's worth learning zookeeper because most of the systems have been designed on the same principles whether it's mongodb whether it's you will see the kafka whether you will see other systems most of them most of them learn most of them have a similar design like zookeeper okay so it's very easy to program and zookeeper exposes the data model like directory directory unlike the database where the data is in the form of rows and columns here the data model is in the form of directory structure just like file system okay just like uh, microsoft windows registry how many of you have seen microsoft windows registry zookeeper's data storage is just like that or ldap how many of you have used ldap so ldap or active directory the the folder structure the storage system zookeeper exposes the 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 interface like that okay zookeeper itself is distributed meaning zookeeper itself would be running on many computers okay all right zookeeper is used for synchronization locking maintaining configuration failover management it is a coordination service that does not suffer from race conditions or deadlocks okay so it's a coordination service it's kind of a central place to which people can write data without worrying too much about race conditions and deadlocks okay so data model is like um, you can think of it like a highly available file system okay so i'll explain data model data model is the most important thing it has a concept called z node z node means a place like folder z node is like folder and the data that you can keep in this is in the form of json object okay json object is java javascript object notation how many of you are aware of json should i explain a bit what is json yes it is like xml just that it is in the form of um, uh, key value pairs okay all right so so a very of very often we uh, have the let's say we want to represent a customer in a file let's say we want to represent a customer in a file you know how many ways can we define a customer we could define a customer like an xml okay or we could just say uh, you know let's say you want to store many customers in one file they have name they have things like that so we could actually store things like name age and uh, let's say 
what is the age and city okay and here we could write the name like age and say 35 and city is somewhere right and similarly we could write david and we could say i don't know the age so i'm just putting 35 and then we say put here the say pittsburgh okay so let's say this way now this is one way of uh, one way of storing data right this is one way of storing data and let's say we have more users say Sachin is there then we put Sachin and then 12 and then say, say 30 and then we say we say um, I am right so this is one way of storing data but this kind of data is not really great format what if what if the city itself need to be described in the form of coordinates right then we will have to we want we will let's say here we have address right address could be uh, address could have further components like state uh, co state country and the city so this format is not great right and uh, therefore we need far more sophisticated format and that's where json comes into play so json looks like this we store it in this format name equals say sandeep okay or let's say we say customers is in this format okay and then here name colon david and then we have name colon sachin okay and similarly we have say age 35 then we have address as vlr right so you can see that this is a very um, simple format right further what if our address was really real, little complicated address was say further a complex object so you could further say city is vlr and uh, state is ka and so on so so you can see that the the format json format is really really flexible it's a hierarchical format object within object within objects okay just like xml okay so this is called json format okay the array is represented by a square bracket so if you have to represent say say an array of three numbers we'll say like this object is represented like the curly brackets and you have key and you have value right so this is the json format okay and this is another key this is another value okay a string is represented by double quotes around it while number is represented without any double quote okay so this is how the json format looks like okay so this could further be an object this could further be an object this this array instead of number it could be a string or it could be another object and so on so it could be it could be at any label it could be to any label okay so you could have arrays of objects you can have objects of objects you can have arrays of arrays of objects and so on so that's json format okay is the simplest any very very powerful format in which you can actually represent any system okay so this is how the json looks like all right so data model is mostly like json so question from noor is searching fast as in relational no it's not you'll have to create indexes around it in a separate way and it doesn't provide the format doesn't provide any kind of searching facility or modification facility it's just for storing in the file or while transferring over the wire right so whenever we are transferring an in-memory object we must convert it into a sequence of numbers or sequence of an array of characters right whenever we are saving something from the memory to the disk 
and that time we have to convert it into sequence of byte this is called serialize this is called serialize and json is one of the serialization formats okay now now the z node does not provide any append operations there are only either delete or update or create now the read and write the data access is atomic either you get the entire data from the z node or nothing z node is basically the no, the folder is called the z node okay so z node each z node can have children each z node can uh, so each z node basically forms the hierarchical namespace and so again the data model is like unix folders so at the top we have first z node called slash okay this is the z node in case of zookeeper and inside it let's say zoo is there and then zoo has duck goat and cow okay all of these z node can have data unlike the windows folder structure where there is folder or file here there is only one thing called z node this is a z node this is a z node this is z node so your question would be where do we keep data we keep data on every z node in the form of json objects okay so that's what is the z node about so so there are three kinds of z node okay all right uh, all right sachin has a good question question from sachin is is zookeeper come in hadoop ecosystem is if so what's the difference between hdfs and zookeeper good question good question so zookeeper is not exactly part of hadoop ecosystem but zookeeper is a product which is used by hadoop ecosystem when i say used by hadoop ecosystem hdfs uses zookeeper hdfs uses zookeeper yarn uses zookeeper hive uses zookeeper kafka uses zookeeper although kafka is not part of hadoop and the h base uses zookeeper and so on so almost every service in the hadoop ecosystem and outside uses zookeeper the way our processors the email processors that we talked about were using that central storage in the same way whenever various programs whether it's hadoop's programs or the some other third party programs whenever they need to coordinate they use zookeeper so zookeeper is the unsung hero of the hadoop ecosystem okay it is nowhere counted in any of them okay but what i realized and what i saw in past is understanding zookeeper's design is a very very important aspect of understanding the distributed computing the paxos algorithm and and so on it is going to be it's going to be uh, i'm going to describe all of that by the way of zookeeper so i i personally believe that if you haven't gone through zookeeper you haven't understood much of the high high performance computing and you haven't understood much of a distributed computing okay so is it like zookeeper is above hdfs to save data into as no is the other way around okay so zookeeper doesn't depend on hdfs while hdfs does depend on zookeeper question from alok we can keep json only on only one z node yes one one json object on one z node question from indoy why the, do not in hadoop include zookeeper in its ecosystem since there are so many components using it so basically uh, the zookeeper is a top level project in apache ecosystem okay so it was uh, it is basically come since many other softwares use zookeeper therefore it was better to keep it independent program instead of keeping it part of hadoop only okay kafka is also using zookeeper then then the spark is also using it and so on so so it was better to keep it outside that's one of the reasons okay 
a question from Sachin is, uh, what is Zenode? Zenode is like a folder, the way we store data in a file system in the folder. In the same way, we have Zenode, okay? So Zenode, you can, although it sounds like node as in machine, no, it's not a machine, machine or a computer. Zenode is just like a folder in which you keep on putting the data. And data, you put it in the form of JSON. A question from Noor, where does JSON store then? Expanding to Grishma. Yes, that I will come back to, come back to that as we go into detail. Question from Alok, how it will differ single Z node and the nested one? So I'll, I'll just show you actually the, the it, this is going to be, so there's something called persistent Z node. Okay, I'm going to give you a demo of this. Okay, so at the console, what you can do is you can say, Zookeeper client, okay, and in here, okay, let me just give you the command. Where did the command go? Zookeeper client, correct? So this is the command that I'm using on the console, and here when I run that command, I get the prompt. This is my Zookeeper prompt, okay? This is my Zookeeper prompt, and also let me just decrease the Okay, never mind. So this is my Zookeeper prompt. Here, I could say create, okay? And also, first of all, I can take a look at the other Z nodes. This ls command is also provided by Zookeeper. So right now, I'm talking to Zookeeper. So when I say ls slash, these are the Z nodes created by the ls command, okay? These are the Z nodes created by the ls command. And sorry, I'm so sorry. These are the Z nodes which are existing at the top level, okay? Let's say I want to take a look at this. I want to say ls slash this. There's nothing inside it, okay? So let's say inside this, what are the, the Z nodes here, okay? It says there is something called ID. So I could take a look at the ID, okay? And if I want to take a look at the data of anything, I can always say get and take a look at it. So right now I'm interacting with Zookeeper. So it's saying that the data in this ID, the data in this ID is this. The data in this ID is this. Okay, so Slash is a Z node, okay? Cluster is a Z node and ID is a Z node. Slash is a top level one. You can take a look at the data of this slash, okay? I've used get slash command to see the data. The data is empty. Then I'm saying, give me the data of slash cluster. That one is again null, okay? But the data in case of, okay? So using ls command, we could take a look like, um, right? We could take a look at that data. So this is the JSON object. Noor, can you see this? This is a JSON object. This, these are the other attributes of the Z node. Okay. A question from Grace. Uh, the I'm a little confused between Zookeeper's usage and HDFS. You will soon come to know. Don't worry about it. Just think of Zookeeper as if it has nothing to do with HDFS. Okay. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm saying get slash slash is the top level Z node. Then second, this is the uh, another Z node and then slash this, okay? This is how we define the structure, okay? So I'm going to create my Z node, okay? Create, I'm going to call it, what is the rate today? So I'll call it um, batch three fab and 18. And this is my data, this is, Let's say a 
okay i have to put a slash because i want to create it at the top level okay so you can see that it has created this g node okay so i can take a look at the data of this one it's pretty simple all we are doing is we are putting data and getting the data so you can see that this is our json object actually okay hmm. so this is the json object now okay so so what we have done is what we have done is we have used this so under this all right so okay let me explain to you what i mean to do here is here what i am trying to do is i'm creating a kind of a folder or you can say this folder is called z node okay so i'm creating a z node at the top level and then i'm putting the data in it okay so yes so all right now inside this let me see that i'm putting another z node Okay, here I'm putting one Z node called SG and I'm saying create and I'm just putting some random data in it. Okay, let me just put name is say Sandeep. Okay, this is my JSON object. All right, so that's pretty much for today. We will We'll continue from here tomorrow. Okay, we are going to uh, go over the Zookeeper tomorrow, and probably the tom tomorrow we'll finish Zookeeper and start with HDFS. All right. So yeah. So right now, what we have done is we have just learned to create Z node. We will all do the hands-on tomorrow. Okay. Okay, a question from Rajan is, you can say get, how to get the data. You can just say get and give the URL, give the full path of the Z node and you will see the data. Okay, so this was quick. How to come out of this? You can press control and D. I'm pressing control and D once. So I'm coming out of it. In Unix, every input can be ended with control D. A question from Hitendra is that when we are creating Z node, do we have to assign a JSON value to it? Yes. All right. So we will continue from here in tom tomorrow at the same time. All right. Sorry for taking up eight more minutes. We were in the middle of discussion, so I thought it would be unfair to disrupt it. So we'll continue uh, from learning to create Zenode. And uh, yeah, we will first learn, we'll do the practical and then learn the theory. All right. Bye-bye. It's great to have all of you in session. And question is, will you give us a brief introduction to Java? Sure, sure, David, I'll review that, the, your enrollment and we'll fix it. Okay, thank you everyone. I hope that uh, today's session was useful. Question for Mintao is, will you give us a brief introduction to Java? Java is not required, but in your my courses, you should be able to see Java. If that is not sufficient, then we can plan something. All right. So Grisma is also not able to see any Spark videos. Okay. Let me just make a note of it. Okay, with respect to... 
I'll just review this. I'll just see what happens. Where did it go wrong? All right, Ravi, I'll also test your account after this and so on. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. I look forward to see you tomorrow and we'll continue from Zenode and we'll finish Zookeeper tomorrow. A question from David is I received an, uh, an email to review the first four classes. Will we receive additional emails? Uh, I'll just need to check which. A question from David is, I received an, e an email to review the first four classes. Okay, will we receive additional emails? So, no, actually, the all of this is actually, uh, you know, this one you can skip. This one you can skip, rest of it is mandatory. And uh, this one is also, these uh, 10 and 11 is also optional. I will just mark them optional. Okay, and rest of it is mandatory. So, yeah. So you can you can actually start reviewing whatever you wish to do. Okay, tomorrow we are most likely going to do the hands-on. So I would suggest that before tomorrow, you make yourself comfortable with Linux. Okay, just go over this Linux basics and it'll be easy. Okay. Great, thank you everyone. Wonderful, wonderful, David. So you are all set and you can start with Zookeeper hands-on. I think the first exercise is something that we are trying to do today. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so great to have all of you in the session. I look forward to see you tomorrow. I see, I see. Great, great. So this will be a great chance to uh, get yourself, uh, you know, prepared on Linux, and uh, that's the most important skill to have. Okay, bye-bye, have a good day.